excited. This is a, feels a little bit like a fresh start. I know we were just here last Sunday. God willing, we'll be back next Sunday, but today feels a little bit different. It's 2023 now, and so I want to say welcome. From the looks of things, I need to take just a moment or two to say welcome to those of you who are just now joining online because you are slow getting started this morning after a late night last night. Well, we, we miss you, but I'm glad you're with us online, and we are saving your seat for you for next week. And, and maybe since it's the first day of the new year, be a good time to say a word of welcome to those of you who, who have been joining us online for several years now since we began this, and you have found your online worship to be your favorite way to, to be a part of uh, the, the ministry here. I just want to let you know that we have a place for you as well. I invite you to come. Maybe this will be the year that you will find your way back into the fellowship of, of worship with fellow believers. You know, the Bible says not to forsake the gathering of yourselves together, which some are in the manner of doing. And so with that, uh, I would invite you to come and be a part of what God is doing in his church. We'd love to see you and have you be here. But in any case, welcome. What a great way to start the new year first day of the new year to come together with God's people in God's house around his word. And those of you that know me well know that I'm not big on resolutions. I don't do a lot of New Year's resolutions. I just don't, don't really appreciate um, making plans that I never really intend on keeping. So uh, you know, uh, I'd like to tell you I have resolved to do this and that and the other, but the reality is I gave that up a long time ago, but I am someone to think about challenges, and I'd like to place a couple of challenges before us this morning as a church as we are moving into these um, difficult and sometimes uncharted waters of our culture as we look around and we see things happening that to confuse us, things that seem to be very difficult, maybe even alarming to us. And so the question is, how are we as a church going to relate? How, what are we going to do to prepare for what is happening in our world? And so the first challenge I have made to myself, and that is I have given myself the challenge to be faithful, to preach, and to teach to you the Word of God without compromise, without apology, just to stay with that. Um, I want you to know that I do not see, thank you, I do, I do not see m my position here as one that seeks to entertain you with clever anecdotes and stories. That's not what I've been called to do. I am not your, on Sunday mornings anyway, I'm not your psychologist or your counselor or your life coach. I think there's a place for those things in our church, uh, and God's got a word to say to us about those kinds of things, but I don't believe this sacred time together before the Lord as his people is a time for those kinds of things. I have reserved this portion of my ministry to be a teacher and a preacher of his word, the truth. Okay, and, and my challenge then goes to you. I challenge you to be a student of the truth, to hunger for the things of God as he reveals them to us in his word to learn what God's word has to say so that we can be great stewards of the life that he's given us and we can be ministers to one another and to this world because we are equipped for every good work because we have been students of his truth. I challenge you to be a part of that. And so I want us to work together this year, to grow together, to learn together. And I want to challenge you to be a part of that. And as, as uh, has already been mentioned this morning, we're going to start today in the book of Romans. And I'm going to invite you to open to Romans chapter 1. And, and as you do that, I want to let you know that I cannot adequately teach the book of Romans in a 30 to 40 minute section one time a week. 
This is, I, I, all I can really do is give an overview. Even if I am going as deep as I feel led to go here in this room, it will not stick. It will not matter. It will not make a difference unless you pick that up and take it home with you and become a student to go even deeper. So as you're doing your daily Bible reading, as you're doing your devotional time and your study time, I want to challenge you to get into the book of Romans for a while. Let's learn this book together. I'm going to tell you why I chose Romans in just a moment. But I want you to study with me. Get a good uh, study Bible if you do not have one. Go into our new bookstore. There are several commentaries, layman's commentaries, commentaries that will help you uh, on the book of Romans. And you can begin to see how to study, learn how to study, go kind of beneath the text, ask hard questions. I want to challenge you as you're reading and you're coming up against some questions, some, some verses maybe that you don't understand or some concepts that you're struggling with. I want to invite you to ask Send me an email. Send one of our other pastors an email or a text and say, hey, look, I've been in Romans chapter 4 and I'm struggling with this this morning. Will you help me? And I promise you, you will be answered as we get those questions coming in. We want to study this word together. I've entitled this study, The Objective. And I've done that for a couple of reasons. I think there's a twofold purpose behind calling a study of the book of Romans the objective. And the first thing is that we see in the book of Romans God's objective. If Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we call those the Gospels, if they tell us what Jesus did while here on earth, it is Romans that tells us why he did it. What did God have in mind when he sent Jesus? What is God's plan to save and to redeem and to forgive? We find those things in the book of Romans. But the objective is not just that God has given his objective, but we also have our own objective here. And that is to learn about God's plan of salvation, to learn the whys, to be more theologically equipped and astute, to be able to answer questions when they come to us from our friends and our family members. And I've chosen the book of Romans because it is so rich and it is so full in giving us God's objective, giving us the reasons for our faith. Well, I could start quoting verses this morning from the book of Romans, and, I, and most of you would, would at least be familiar with them. In the book of Romans, we find so many of the, of the anchors of our faith, the truths that we hold on to, things like, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation. That's Romans chapter 1. We go on, for all sin and fall short of the glory of God. That's Romans 3. We, we read God demonstrated his own love for us in this, in that while we were yet sinners, what happened? Christ died for us. So you know that already. That's Romans 5. Then we read the wages of sin is death. That's a big problem until we read the rest of that verse when it says, but the gift of God is eternal life. Thank you for knowing this. We're going to continue to learn it together. The gift of God is eternal life. Over in the, in the 12th chapter, we read that we are to present our bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable unto God, which is our reasonable act of worship. And then it says, and do not be conformed to this world. Okay. Okay, we need to know that, right? Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may be able to prove that which is the good, the perfect will of God. All of those things are significant parts of our faith. The Bible is full, but the, but the, the book of Romans is a concise, specific explanation of why God did what he did, and how we, as his children, are to respond. So we're going to begin this morning in just a way of introduction with chapters 1, uh, verses 1 through 7. So I want you to follow along as we, as we get into these verses together. We might call this the prologue of the book of Romans. If you don't know what the word prologue means, it's basically a trailer. 
You know what a trailer is? We, Patty and I were able to take our grandkids to a little movie over the holidays when they were, when they were off. And uh, I did not enjoy the movie nearly as much as I did the trailers. <laughs> I'm just being honest with you. You know, so what a trailer does is it takes a movie, it's a couple hours long, and it condenses it into about a minute and a half. But it puts the good stuff in there. <laughs> And so I'd just, I'd just be content to go to the theater and watch trailer after trailer after trailer after trailer. You're just getting the good stuff. And that's kind of what a prologue is. A prologue is, okay, this is a great book. Let me tell you what it's going to be about. Let me explain it to you as we get started. So there's a little summary here. But he begins with, with the source of his truth. We know that the Apostle Paul was the human author of the book of Romans. Now, why did I say human author? Somebody tell me that. He physically wrote it. But who's the, who's, God's the author of the Holy Spirit. We believe that all scripture is God breathed. Okay, so we have that. So, but Paul said, I, he, he, under the inspiration and the leadership of the Lord had something to say. And he defined that in the very first verse. I want you to notice that while Paul said, I scripted this, he's very clear on where this truth came from in verse 1. We see the source of his truth. He says, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. That's a pretty great start, if you ask me. He says, it's Paul. You know me, I'm Paul, but I'm not here as, as, as one who is acting on his own, but rather I'm a servant. Some translations say slave of the Lord Jesus. Okay, I'm working for a higher authority. I like that. I, I like his candor here. To you, Paul was an incredibly educated man, an incredibly gifted man. He certainly had the skill to, to teach and to write. And he could have made quite a living for himself, particularly if he chose to take credit for all that he had to say and all that he had to write. We give Paul credit for more than half of the New Testament that he scripted it with his own hand. However, he was very careful and very humble to say, these are not my words. I am just the messenger. This word is coming from God himself. I am a servant of the Lord. And then he goes on, he talks about his apostleship. That means one who has been given the charge to go out with this message. That's the apostle part. So he says, I am a servant of the Lord, but he has charged me to go out and do something. And here's the something. Set apart for the gospel of God. That word set apart is the word sanctified or sanctification we use in the church sometimes. I have been chosen, selected, empowered, and sent out for one purpose. There's only one thing that he was called to do. The gospel. To share the gospel, to tell the truth of the gospel, to help men, women, boys, and girls know that God loves them and that Jesus Christ is the way of salvation. That's the gospel message. That's the good news. I have been sent as a messenger from God to tell good news to people. That's how he starts this powerful letter, the gospel. And we're going to find the gospel here. We're going to find it over and over and over again. And then let's go to verse 2 through 4. Because as he continues in this prologue. He goes now to a little synopsis. We're asking, okay, God's called you to, to share the gospel. But exactly what is that gospel? Give me a taste of it. And this is what he does in 2 through 4. He says, verse 2. Which... He promised beforehand, which is talking about the gospel, this gospel, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Concerning his son. Okay, just making sure everybody's on the same page. His son is Jesus. Jesus. Were you here last week when we talked about the name Jesus? Okay. So, 
concerning Jesus, who was descended from David according to the flesh, born of the flesh, and was declared to be the Son of God in power according to the Spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead. Jesus Christ, our Lord. Now that's a mouthful. That's a mouthful, but it says it all. If we think about it, it says, first of all, he is, this is a book about Jesus. You remember the Gospels said, this is what Jesus did while he was on earth. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So we can read that. We can read the historicity of it. We can see how he spent his days. See how he was born, the miracles, his teachings. We see his death, his resurrection. All of that is depicted in the Gospels. But that doesn't mean that only Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are about Jesus. And Paul is making that very clear. God has asked me to write a book about Jesus. But I'm not going to write about what he did. I'm going to write about why he did it. And how we are benefactors of God's objective to save the world. It's about his son. He goes on and says, this son was promised by the prophets. There's some history in the book of Romans. If you read over in, in chapters 10 and 11, and when we get there, he's going to talk about this connection between the Jews of the Old Testament and the Gentiles of the New Testament. It's something that kind of becomes a mystery to us right now. And a lot of people will say, I just don't really understand that. I don't get how we are connected and how the two Testaments, Old and New, are connected together. And there are some people who, who kind of see the God of the Old Testament as a different God than the God of the New Testament. And Paul says, no, that's not where we're going with this. Same God. I'm going to show you how those things fit together. We need to learn that. Then he goes on and says, affirmed by the Holy Spirit. We're going to see a lot of the Holy Spirit in the book of Romans. The work and the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Something that, that for many of us is still kind of a mystery. I just don't understand how the Holy Spirit indwells in a person's life and I don't understand about gifts of the spirit and what that means and there are some churches that teach one thing and some churches that teach another thing concerning the work and the ministry and the gifts of the spirit Paul says let me tell you about that let me tell you about his work and you read over particularly in chapter 12 and you're going to see a very concise and clear description of the the gifts of the spirit and the work and ministry of the holy spirit and he says, confirmed by the resurrection. I love the fact that in his introduction, he put in the resurrection. Well, I want you to get this. It is the resurrection of Jesus Christ that separates and delineates Christianity from all other world religions. We have a resurrection. And we celebrate that resurrection. We have a living Savior. He's in the world today. I know that he is living whatever men may say. I see his hand of mercy. I hear his voice of cheer. And just the time I need him, he's always near. He lives, he lives. Paul says, as a servant of the Most High God, as his ambassador, as his messenger, we need to talk about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's in here, and we'll find it. But then he says, uh, he closes this out by talking about just the title, Jesus Christ, our what? Our Lord. Oh, he is no longer the suffering servant that we see in the Gospels. But he is now the risen, reigning Lord of Lords and King of Kings. We're going to see that in the book of Romans. Now that's a trailer. I'd love to see that movie. I'd love to read that letter. We need to get excited about it. He's telling us God's objective. His objective in sending Jesus. His objective in redeeming the world and saving the world. His plan is being unfolded step by step and piece by piece. And he's doing that so that we should know it, so that we should learn it. But then he goes on. And he gives the purpose of this great truth. 
Look at verse 5. He tells us why he's given us this letter. Through whom? Jesus. We have received grace. An apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name. Okay, that's a lot of words. Let me explain it very simply. So that we can be saved. That's what he's saying. Do you see grace in there? Do you see faith in there? It's there. In another, in another letter, Paul wrote, For we are saved by grace through faith. And here, he just kind of spells it out so that we could know God as a God of grace, a God of mercy, a God of truth. And that we can experience the faith in him that will provide forgiveness of sin, that will provide a redeemed relationship with him so that we can be saved forever and eternal. That's the purpose of this truth. He spells it out so that we can know him and his salvation. And then finally, we see in this little prologue the recipients of his truth. Who's this for? Who's this for? He's very clear. In the second half of verse uh, 5, it says, Among all the nations. Well, we could just stop right there. <laughs> That's, that's a lot. Among all the nations. God has always been the God of the nations. And Romans reminds us of that. God has, has, has a call for all people. We turn to the book of Revelation and, and we see a glimpse of things that are yet to come. Through a vision given by John on the Isle of Patmos. And as he looks into the throne room of God, he sees there every tribe, every tongue, every nation rejoicing and worshiping him. Paul said, this truth of salvation is for everyone. Everyone. Now he goes on, he doesn't end it there. Because the name of this book is Romans. Okay, this is not deep and theological here. Who was it written to? Romans. Where's Rome? It's in Italy. My point is, these are Greeks. They're non-Jewish peoples. And we don't, we don't, that doesn't bother us much today, but it bothered them a whole lot in the first centuries, particularly those Jewish Christians who thought, how in the world can these non-Jews become followers of Jesus? They struggled with that. And so when Paul wrote to all nations, it was kind of like, yeah, I get that, but what about us? We're Romans. And then he said this, to all those in Rome even. To all those in Rome. Did you know as we read the book of Acts? The book of Acts kind of sets up this book of Romans because in the book of Acts we find the Apostle Paul who is an itinerant missionary going from people group to people group to people group. And he's got one heart cry that he puts above all the others. And that is, I want to preach the gospel in Rome. Rome. Do you know how he did it? He went out and got himself arrested. That's what he did. He got arrested and they put him in shackles, put him on a ship and shipped him over to Rome. And the last book, uh, the last verse in the book of Acts says that he spent the last years of his life under house arrest in, isn't that cool? In Rome, Preaching the gospel without hindrance. He got his wish. God gave him the desire of his heart before he died. Then the Roman government got a little upset. And took off his head. But for two years, he preached to Rome. You've ever wondered why Rome? Because Rome in that century, first century, 
was the center of the culture of the world. And Paul went around preaching the gospel to them. So when he wrote this letter for them to clarify the objective of God in saving the world, he wanted to make sure you are included. Now, wait a minute. Say, Pastor, why are you saying this to, to me this morning? Why does that matter to me? Let me tell you something. Because in some people's categories, you are Rome. Listen to me. Listen to me. You are Rome. And I'm going to tell you something else. There are some people in your world who for you represent Rome. Those that you just can't believe would be savable. Those you can't believe would be open and receptive to the gospel. I'm telling you, you do a little historical research on Rome, you think our culture is vile now. Oh my goodness, first century Rome wrote a book on perversion and, and hatred and abuse. That, that, you talk about ugly. We see it all there. And Paul said, those people can be saved. Are you kidding me? Rome? Yep, 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 even Rome. Some of you may be sitting here thinking, you know what, pastor, I've just kind of gone too far. God doesn't have anything for me. Yes, he does. Yes, he does. Even you can be saved. Some of you are thinking about friends, family, or loved ones right now, and they're out there, and they are just so cold to the gospel. They don't want anything to do with Jesus or his word, and you're thinking, you know, I just don't believe they will ever come to know the Lord. They just may. So he starts with all the nations, and the people that were reading this said, yeah, right, but you don't know these people down the street from me because we live in Rome. And he said, yeah, even to the Romans. Even to the Romans and those who believe. It's a word for all. It's God's word. It's God's truth. So now I want to end where I started with a challenge. I'm going to do my best to teach it. I want to challenge you to do your best to learn it. Maybe learn it over again. I plan to learn some brand new stuff as I prepare to teach I want you to look at it like it's fresh and new and dig deep and learn it with a purpose, not just to be informed, but to be transformed. That's what we're going to learn in chapter 12, verse 2, by the renewing of your mind. Well, how do we renew our mind? By putting the Word of God in it. Amen. Let's do it right now, starting together. Let's come out of this study together sometime later this year or, I don't know, two, four, five years from now, whenever we finish. Let's come out of this study together being better stewards of God's truth. Thank you for viewing this message from Old Fort Baptist Church. Here at Old Fort, we value biblical truth, missional living, and vital connections. To learn more about who we are and what we do, please visit us online at oldfortbaptist.org. To help support the ongoing ministry of the church, you can give at oldfortbaptist.org give. Thank you, and God bless.